Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, as always, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access it on demand. Later this afternoon, we'll be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take a few minutes near the end of today's presentation and go through the audience questions. And finally, at the end of today's webinar, we will be doing a drawing for, to, for three $50 Amazon gift cards. So stick around. We'll do a random drawing. Hopefully your name will be one of the three chosen. All right, with that, we'll kick off today's webinar, which is Deploying Secure Modern Apps in Evolving Infrastructures. Our speaker today is Brendan Makareg, who is Senior Director of Product Marketing at Signal Sciences. Hi, Brendan. How are you? Thanks for joining me. Yeah, very good to be here. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get to it. Cool. Thanks very much. Welcome, everyone. Um, today, I want to talk to you about a uh, few things that have to do with a paper that we put out about oh, about three months ago. Uh, it's called Modern Applications and Architectures Demand a New Web, Web Application Firewall. And what we did here is we um, we basically surveyed uh, how our customers are installing signal sciences, and we have a very flexible architecture, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, but basically just know that the, the high level findings I'm sharing with you are from that paper. So if you wanna get it, you can go to our website at signalsciences.com forward slash resources and look for that. Again, it's called Modern Applications and Architectures Demand a New Web Application Firewall. But in this webinar, I'm gonna talk to you about a few things. I'll introduce myself and then talk about, talk about something called why I refer to the constant in technology and software development. And then I'm also going to talk to you about securing modern uh, architectures and the new development models, as well as a mix of modern infrastructures where applications are deployed. And what this is all going to lead up to is talking about what really, within that context, what makes for effective web defense. And I'm going to talk a bit about our approach to security applica web, uh, application security. So again, my name is Brendan Mackerig. I uh, head up product marketing here at Signal Sciences. Um, I began my career as a technology journalist at PC Magazine back in the early 90s, um, and then I pivoted to product management, where I oversaw the development uh, of web and mobile applications in various, um, mostly consumer-facing um, consumer uh, applications. And then I transitioned into product marketing, uh, seven of which I have had in security. So as prior, I was at uh, CrowdStrike, where I supported the uh, incident response team from a marketing standpoint. Then I was also at Symantec where I launched both um, consumer and enterprise security products. So let's talk about the single constant. Um, as in life, you know, with technology and software development, change is constant, the delta. Um, and there's just no better example of it than in software design, implementation, and deployment. We've seen in the last decade a proliferation of cloud and microservices and APIs. And what this means basically is that legacy web application firewalls were developed before all of this. Um, and they're just struggling to keep up with this change. And something that we hear constantly from our customers is that, you know, resource constraints are driving some a lot of this change, but also, you know, limited is a favorite word of CISOs or the lack. They lack qualified staff. They lack time to devote to security. Um, they lack funds or, or they already have their funds allocated for other um, de development, deployment and, and security tools. And in some cases, there's just they're just change adverse. Um, so again, I'm going to talk about the three delta areas impacting application security, um, architecture, development, and infrastructure. And basically, I'm going to talk about how these changes in these three areas have necessitated a new approach to web application security, um, and namely that there, ne there needs to be a new breed of web application firewall. So again, we use data from Signal Sciences customers, and we see that one of the most important aspects of WAF is the ability to deploy it in a wide variety of architecture and infrastructure models. This provides not only the most reliable coverage, but actually also meets the needs of any organization delivering modern applications. So let's talk about modern architectures. Um, modern apps are de de decomposing down into APIs and microservices. On the left here, this is your typical legacy monolithic application where all the functions were you know, 
coexisting together very closely together. Um, and what we've seen over the last decade is that on the right here, that this is your typical de de deployed uh, distributed app application here. It's a ride sharing application and you have all these different APIs that are basically you know, being triggered when certain things need to happen. So if you want to talk about passenger management, the application needs to manage drivers out on the road. It needs to make a call to basically send a notification, et cetera. Whatever functions that the app needs to uh, execute, it, it basically does them on the fly with these different APIs. And here we see that today's applications are very complex. They're layered um, from left to right. Basically, the user's web request comes in, and then it hits a CDN to you know cache, serve up the cache uh, content. Behind the CDN is a WAF, um, and then you have load balancers, um, an API gateway. Uh, you know, yet another load balancer and then it basically goes either um, in terms of whether it's a monolithic app or a microservice based application um, we basically have to still secure all these you know whether it's monolithic or a microservices based application uh, that perhaps has including kubernetes or uh, containers or service mesh like istio um, you know the, the challenge is still the same you have attackers that are going to try to reach your applications and whether it's a monolithic app or a microservices based application, you still have to protect them. So let's talk about uh, the needs for basically where, where the WAF lives um, and where, uh, why that is. So, you know, usually the WAF used to be put at the top of an NTR architecture, uh, but there's some issues with that. Um, basically, you're relying on an inline architecture that's slow and inefficient. Um, the WAF requires tuning as new applications are built or deployed. And you can't, you can't support multiple content delivery networks. And it basically becomes a choke point that's expensive to deploy and maintain. Let's talk about software development models for a few minutes. Um, some of this will be remedial, some of it won't be, but let's talk about how we've gone from waterfall. And in this stage, you know, usually you put together a long list of requirements, you design the app, you fill out a Gantt chart and so cart, so on. But basically each phase of the development life cycle is fed into a subsequent stage. So month by month, the work is cascaded down from the customer to design to the developers, and which is, that's why it's called the waterfall method. It's basically uh, a very regimented method. Um, the hallmarks are pretty familiar though. Usually products can go over long, overdue, over budget. And it's generally not what the customer wanted in the first place because by the time you release the final application, uh, the market's changed. And then around 2001, there was a manifesto called the Agile Manifesto that came out. And this was basically in response to Waterfall and, and knowing what the weaknesses are of, were of that methodology. Since then, Agile has rippled across the industry and it's been a huge success. Um, you know, it's, it's in fact almost every software development organization on the planet because it promises faster development cycles and cycles that are measured in days rather than months or years, which is commonly experienced in Waterfall shops. Agile's only disadvantage is that it was mostly used by developers and left out the operations teams. And then finally, now we have the rise of DevOps, which is basically because cloud computing adoption has been on the rise um, and infrastructure as code became a mainstream idea. So with the combination of those two, Agile moved into new territory. And basically you joined two disparate groups, development and operations, and that meant that applications and services could be delivered together. And this created an innovation and feedback loop across the entire system. So instead of being able to just make changes to the app in days, DevOps ushered in the ability to deploy the entire system. That's, that is the application and infrastructure multiple times a day. And this created the agility and the velocity that businesses craved so they could innovate and stay ahead of the competition. But with the evolution of software development practices, we have to change how we implement the defense of those applications. So let's turn to infrastructures. Now the question that comes up is where is my app running? Um, you know, it's a significantly harder question to answer these days than just a few decades ago. You know, the long answer is you've got your app running in a mix of modern, um, a heterogeneous mix of hardware, cloud, and containers. Um, and also the question asks us, asks us to consider just one application, but there could be there's multiple, obviously, in many organizations. And if we expand that to an entire web domain or property, the more likely answer is the more of a heterogeneous mix of hardware cloud containers you have, the more distributed your application footprint. So, you know, the, the short version of this answer is, well, it's complicated um, because as we've seen a proliferation of infrastructure, of different languages, of different means by which to rapidly release code, 
to different infrastructure, it's, it, it gets complicated pretty quickly. Signal Sciences customers range from some of the largest websites on the planet to healthcare startups, to media and large enterprises and more. Um, and we see that across these different verticals, we looked at how our customers were using various infrastructure. And basically, what, as the chart shows here, Amazon is um, pretty dominant. That's no surprise. They were one of their, I believe they came out in 2006, this AWS was their first cloud-based service that was available to folks. Um, and we've seen that other cloud platform providers, the usage heavily skews obviously towards AWS, but there are also others that are out there. Um, Azure, Heroku, IBM, Google's cloud platform. Um, but basically cloud adoption is just one measure of infrastructure. Um, the way that uh, customers deploy our solution within that infrastructure is another lens to view application security through. So as we've seen by looking at where our customers deploy us, um, modern software really de de requires flexible deployment options. So does water, modern application defense. And we see that there's four major ways that uh, we offer our customers to deploy our, our solution. Um, WAF and a web server. So this is Signal Sciences hooking directly into the web server through our module for our IIS, Apache, and Nginx. It's the most common way our customers use us, um, and we have broken out these web server variations and deployment modes in the graph here. Um, obviously, Nginx is the market leader in terms of web servers, um, and that, that, that's reflected here in our chart as our usage as well. We also uh, allow our customers to deploy uh, WAF as a proxy. So that means they can use this as a standalone reverse proxy to front any HTTP or HTTPS application or service. And that means that even applications that have gone untouched for years can still be defended. As a standalone proxy, um, customers can use us in conjunction with popular load balancers like HAProxy or Nginx Plus. Thirdly, uh, customers can deploy us as a RASP language module. So that means you can run us inside your Java, Go, Python, .NET, Node.js, or PHP applications. And fourth, uh, CloudWAF. We just recently launched this deployment option, and it's easiest of the four. All it requires is that you change the CNAME record of your site or DNS's, of your service's DNS record to point traffic to our cloud engine, where we host agents that inspect and in decision upon the web requests. So basically what that means is you route your web website or web application service traffic requests to us, and basically we inspect them and correlate uh, with uh, additional context within our cloud engine. And we basically block the bad requests and then let the good requests through to your final um, application origin. Um, you'll notice though, one, one, one last thing on this last slide, you'll notice that we have a category um, called containers, serverless, and others. Um, signal sciences can be deployed within almost any container workload, and it can function inside of API gateways like Section IO and Kong to defend APIs and serverless functions. That's something I wanted to, to point out as well. As far as uh, effective web defense, um, there's another constant. So change is obviously something in technology and software development always at play, but because infrastructure varies, um, we have to look at where an application security tool should run in terms of infrastructure. A homogenous infrastructure in an organization of any size is very unlikely. Um, you know, one of the keys to securing and defending modern applications and APIs is breadth of coverage across any infrastructure because the application has been decomposed into smaller services and components, the defense needs to be spread to those same delivery stacks as well. And to get the necessary coverage, defense tools, whether an open source or commercial, should be evaluated for use in these different uh, pieces of infrastructure. So major cloud providers, that's AWS's or IBM, Google Cloud Platform, um, container platforms, so Kubernetes, Docker, hardware web servers, so that's your load balancers and web servers, um, serverless options such as API gateways, platform services like Heroku or other language plugins. So being able to run in these different pieces of infrastructure is one lens to look at. Let's talk about at the very, um, at the request level. Basically modern web defense should split detection and decisioning. And there's two distinct advantages here. Uh, it, it dramatically lowers the false positive rate to near zero. And it's much more accurate because it allows the collection of security telemetry that can be acted on holistically rather than as discrete events. Decisions are enriched by intelligence gathered from the entire HTTP or HTTPS conversation between the client and server. And I'm gonna get into this a little bit more um, on how we examine web requests. And then secondly, splitting up detection and decisioning eliminates the tuning period or the learning mode. So the end result is basically that security can keep pace 
um, with any software development cadence that the business requires. So if you keep you know, releasing faster and faster, this methodology of inspecting and, and dividing up detection decisioning on web requests still applies. So with signal sciences, um, knowing all of this, uh, it really go back, goes back to the root of our, our founding. Our founders met at Etsy where they ran uh, product management, security, and operations. And back then, they basically were getting really frustrated with the current um, application security tools, which basically means legacy WAF appliances. Um, they could see that the need to drive code and stay ahead in the marketplace was running up against um, security concerns. The, the current legacy WAF uh, appliances were basically black boxes to them because they could see that uh, requests were getting blocked, but they didn't know have the context on why. So they developed signal sciences from the ground up to increase security, maintain site reliability, and without sacrificing speed or scale. And they also wanted to basically make everyone in the organization a security stakeholder, from engineering to security and operations. Let's let's go up a level though to uh, what's out there in the threat landscape. You know, we've talked about uh, changing development software models, uh, the mix of infrastructure that applications are deployed to, uh, the different um, architecture design for applications, and how apps have gone from being monolithic to dispersed or uh, decomposed service, you know, service-based applications. But in terms of the threat landscape, web app attacks are still the number one source of data breaches. Um, in the incumbent web legacy WAFs are not solving that problem. And, and again, for the third time this year, if you look at something like the Verizon uh, incident, incident uh, data breach incident report, report um, basically web apps are the, still the number one threat vector that attackers are using to breach organizations. And meanwhile, you know the, the data center security budgets are not getting any bigger. So. There's a saying that we have here at Signal Sciences, we like to make security visible. Um, as, as the image here points to OWASP inje injection attacks, so, such as SQL injection, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We know that the real world attackers are persistent. They're gonna utilize multiple tactics um, when they try to perpetrate attacks like account takeovers. That's when um, dumps of credentials are found by uh, attackers and basically sold on dark web and basically brute force, they're using a brute force method to break into accounts. Um, direct object reference is occurring when a developer exposes a reference to an internal implementation object, such as a file, a directory, or a database key, and without an access control check or other protection, the attacker can manipulate those references to access unauthorized data. Um, or they may do feature abuse, uh, that's basically when the attacker tries to manipulate the logic flow in your, in your application to gain a, an advantage. Um, and all these real world problems, the legacy WAFs of, we're basically looking at this through the same technology. I was, it's really old, it's 15 years old plus. Um, regex, pattern-based matching, just trying to look for a pattern match is not gonna take care of these real world problems. Also false positives result from generic signatures without any context and they rarely are used in blocking mode. If you compare that to our signal sciences customers, they use this 95% of the time uh, in production in full blocking. Uh, and again, that gets down to the fact that we are um, splitting out decision um, and detection on the, the, the taxes that are coming through on the web request. We really believe in active protection everywhere. Um, we like to say that our approach is centered on protecting any app against any attack and that we also integrate with any DevOps tool chain. From left to right, um, you know, we have talked about the various uh, infrastructure that we run in. So from cloud containers, uh, platform as a service and serverless, the various web servers, different languages, as well as gateways and proxies. We run in all of these to protect our customers. Um, basically, we can provide that visibility and protection for any application regardless of where it sits or where it runs or the underlying architecture. And that to us is the hallmark of a modern web defense solution. Protection against OWASP, as mentioned, is just you know, the tip of the iceberg, um, which by the way, we provide that protection right out of the box with zero rules tuning or customization. Compare that to a legacy WAF appliance where you have to do uh, develop new rules or and then to test those rules in production to make sure that they're not impacting your application performance. You get none of that with us. The real value that our customers express to us is there our ability to provide business logic protection. So this is basically fighting application level, denial of service, brute force attacks, account takeovers, and API misuse and abuse. Those are just some examples. 
And then lastly, here on the right, I want to talk about uh, how we basically make security visible to various teams and make everyone a stakeholder in security. So whether you're a developer, you work in operations and you have SLAs you'll need to keep up, or your security uh, operation staff and you want to stay ahead of the attacker and you want to get that real-time information so you can take action on it, we provide that through alerting through Slack, uh, PagerDuty, um, the various uh, other platform tools that we work with, such as Datadog. We, we work with Splunk as well as a scene, so to speak. Um, so we, we integrate very well uh, through our, our alerting and API. I wanted to talk to you about power rules a little bit. Um, I've, I've mentioned that we go beyond OWASP injection attacks. Um, you know, that we give coverage against API abuse and misuse in the account takeover. Um, what Power Rules do is they take our visibility up even to a greater level by allowing our customers to take the web requests as they come in and inspect any uh, header or other conditional um, input conditions that come along with the header. So you can basically inspect what, what's the user agent, what's the path that the request is trying to access. Are there other methods or schemes that basically are coming through with those web requests, you can set up the signals, which basically will then result in output action. So you can decide to block a request. So let's say you know it comes from, uh, for example, an, uh, an IP that is known to have uh, malicious intent. Uh, we can allow you to block it automatically. However, you know your business better than anyone else. So if you don't want to block automatically, but instead you want to just monitor and keep an eye on these requests that are coming through, you can do that as well. You can also trigger alerts when you have a pattern that uh, there's a there's context around a request that is looking questionable, you can alert as well. And as I mentioned, the alerts will go through those different DevOps tools such as Slack, PagerDuty, et cetera. Um, you know, it's some of this is academic. Uh, the real, you know, puddle hits the metal when our customers talk for us. Um, and I would really encourage you to go to Gartner Peer Insights and see what our customers say, just so you know, these quotes come from unsolicited reviews. Uh, the folks basically, our customers say, they speak to our efficacy, they speak to our customer focus uh, centric mindset. Um, and I'd encourage you to go to Gartner Peer Insights and see what they have to say about Signal Sciences uh, Next Gen WAF. So with that, um, I wanted to open it up to questions to see if we had any come through here. Um, let's see. Yeah, now would be the time, guys. If you have a question uh, for Brendan, please go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions. Um, I do have a start a couple to start us out here, Brendan. So why don't okay. I go ahead and start with that? Um, okay, here's one. My organization wants to adopt DevOps to release code faster. Are there resources you can recommend to get started? Sure. Um, so there's a book called the DevOps Handbook, which is pretty in indispensable as a guide for understanding DevOps concepts and practices. Um, one of the main authors of that book is Gene Kim, um, who many consider one of the primary DevOps experts. He's one of the main authors. And what he, he and the authors in that book really speak to is um, you know, how you can set up and replicate processes that integrate product management, development, QA, your IT operations and information security staff so you can increase the velocity of code releases while still ensuring quality uh, and security. Um, and there's many good thought pieces in that book as well as practical guidance on, on how to set up DevOps practices. So I'd recommend that as a starting point. You can always go on to devops.com too. That's oh, that, a great that well. resource. There's the people that are helping us here <laughs> get resources as well, of course. All right, all right, cool. All right, um, okay, here's a question. We have legacy apps that we would like to protect against abuse. How can Signal Sciences be deployed to do that? So, um, as I mentioned, there's four main options to deploy our, our solution. Um, and I think there's two options here. Um, first is you can run us in reverse proxy mode um, to inspect those web requests before it hits the legacy app. Um, the other is our new cloud WAF deployment option. And that just, again, a primer on that is what's involved there is a DNS change to reroute the web request traffic. So instead of going to your app origin directly, it comes to Signal Sciences cloud engine where we have a hosted agent that will inspect and decision upon the request. And basically, again, we we use our contextual uh, signals to either automatically block. Um, and again, just because the customer is using CloudWAF, they still have all the other uh, features that we offer our other customers and our other deployment models. So 
you're getting all the actionable insights. You're getting a, a centralized um, or, overview of your applications and APIs, the, the requests that are hit, going against them. We give you all the KPIs as well as the alerting so that your team will be alerted. Um, it's the same uh, feature set and the same feature parity as our other deployment options. It's just much easier and quicker to do because it's just a DNS change. There's no software installation involved. Whereas our other options, um, you know, depending on what the customer's requirements are, you know, and how they deploy their applications, they can either use both our agent module or just the agent. Um, it really depends on the customer's requirements. But those are the two um, deployment modes I would recommend for protecting legacy applications. All right, great. Um, yeah, just a reminder, guys, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and use that go to webinar control panel. Uh, here's here's another question for you. Can cloud WAF be deployed on premises? Um, you know, I want to say yes, because if, if your goal is basically to inspect web traffic before mm -hmm. it hits your application origin, that that's a valid way to do it. Um, you know, basically, um, you know, our other deployment options would be considered probably the most prevalent on-prem. So you want to have the agent run alongside your, your application code, um, or you want to install the module on a web server, whether it be Nginx, IIS, Apache. Um, so I, I, would, I see it's Alan who's asking that question. So Alan, I think um, the, the answer there is, you know, you'd have to take a look at how your application is deployed. Um, and if basically, if your goal is just to inspect all the traffic before it reaches the application origin, you can use CloudWAF definitely to do that. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question here. Um, let's see. Most of my clients deploy WAF like uh, F5 uh, ASM and integrate it with a SOC offering like SecureWorks as threat protection appliances. Mm -hmm. Would Signal Sciences integrate in a similar fashion with threat appliances, or is there a better way, non-appliance based? That's, that's a protection? really that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking that. Um, and I get what he's getting at there. So if I'm interpreting this right, I, I know SecureWorks um, fairly well, um, but I may not know the actual appliance he's referring to. But I'll, I'll say this, we have an, we're API first. We have an API that if you want to integrate with a seam, such as uh, if you use Splunk as a seam, to, for example, and you want to get pull the threat telemetry into that to basically query through or develop other KPIs, you can do that. We also recently announced, um, an integration with Cisco uh, Threat Response, which is a SOAR or Security Orchestration Automation uh, Response Platform, where basically you get a, a, a single pane view into all the threat telemetry that your different security tools are feeding in through an API into uh, Cisco Threat Response. Likewise, with Signal Sciences, because we're API first, you can pull in the indicators of compromise into uh, Cisco Threat Response and get that uh, very granular, but yet very quick view into what's happening at the application layer. So I would, um, if SecureWorks, um, and I'm not as familiar with it as I am with other um, teams, if, if they have an API integration available, uh, I would like to say that our indicators can also be fed in to that threat protection um, appliance or platform. Um, so that's that's one way to look at it and on if you wanna uh, dive in. And we do, by the way, on our website, there's a data sheet um, that talks about our integrations. Um, there's also an API specific um, uh, data sheet that we have as well you can you can access to see if this would be a good solution for you excellent okay all right great um next question here um your customers seem to overall install you most using a web server module what is that um so i think this has to do with the fact that uh, web servers like nginx you know iis and apache i mean they were um obviously been around since you know, the inception of the web, so to speak. Um, and yeah. it's, they're the most common means to serve up web content. Um, but I, and, and that's reflected in our stats in terms of where our customers run us on, in terms of the web servers that are used and where, we're, where we're, our modules installed. Um, but as, you, as we see the rise of serverless and containers, uh, clearly they're on the rise. They have uh, efficiencies for making applications uh, faster, higher performance. Um, if you look at something like Envoy, which is a service mesh proxy, um, which basically takes away a lot of the, you know, the net dependence on the network um, in terms of network requests. It, you know, it lets the app do what it needs to do while not being concerned with uh, other low-level functions. Um, you know, that that that's going to 
continue to those types of technologies are going to continue to rise up and we're as i said in my presentation early you know change the delta as in life technology keeps changing uh, we're going to expect change uh, as we go forward and that was one of the the main points i wanted to make early up front um, and as we look at how customers design their apps and the requirements in terms of where they need to deploy their various services um, that's going to dictate where single sciences protects their apps and microservices um, we were designed to be future ready um, and forward looking in that respect and that we realized our founders realized that you know we have to run basically and protect the applications and the microservices wherever they may run um, and that that dual module agent architecture that we we that's patented and that we deploy um, takes that into account basically okay great plenty of time guys if you have a question uh, for Brendan please go ahead and use your go to webinar control panel uh, our next question here we already have a red regex rules based WAF installed so we want to use it to its fullest potential so do you have any recommendations with that that's interesting um, it's tough because you're gonna find that as your team deploys new applications and new code to production um, there's your team's gonna have to and they probably already are they're, they're writing new rules um, that will need to be written uh, as new code is introduced into your production environment and then those new rules are going to have to be tested to ensure that there's no adverse impact in production on your applications. Um, and often by time, depending on the what legacy WAF appliance, it's sometimes by app you have to do that, by the way. Um, but net net, the current rule set's going to get larger and larger as new rules are added. Um, and it's just going to become pretty impractical to manage um, and less efficient. And uh, you know, legacy WAF appliances have to run in these learning modes because that's primarily why you have to test to make sure that the, the rules are adapting to new code as it's as released to production. Um, and that's just not a, a scalable, you know, sustainable model, basically. Um, sure, you can throw another appliance on, <laughs> um, but you, you definitely want to take an approach where that's scalable inherently from the get-go. Um, and that's fundamentally what's different about single sciences versus the legacy WAFs out there is that Again, we were built to scale quickly as our customers traffic scaled um, and to scale across the application footprint. Again, wherever infrastructure, using whatever language, whatever web server, load balancer, wherever our customers deploy the applications, we will run there. Um, and without rules tuning, um, of course we have, as I mentioned, power rules, which is a, another advanced option if you need to get even more granular on what you're looking at in the HTTP and HTTPS uh, headers as they come in or other contextual information that comes along with a web request we allow for that um, but it's just we have a very fundamentally different approach to web application firewall than our, our legacy competitors um, it's going to be really tough for you to do that um, if you want to learn more about this um, we have a white paper called detection and blocking on our website again just go to signalsciences.com forward slash resources and you can download that and, and read about our approach versus the legacy approach Excellent. Okay, I have uh, one more question here. So um, last call, guys, if you have a question, go ahead and get it in now. Um, let's see, here it is. Uh, I have no staff to dedicate to application security, but I am interested in an automated solution to monitor for attacks. What is the best course for me to go? So um, as I mentioned early on in the presentation, you know, we, we hear from our customers that they're dealing with um, either limited staff or no staff for application security. They probably, no doubt they have an IT staff in place. They have software development and engineering staff in place. And those folks have to take on the security, um, you know, security function in those organizations. And uh, what's good about signal sciences is that we really, again, was designed to make everyone in the organization, whether in security or development or operations, everyone can be a security stakeholder because we up level um, the would-be attack information through our dashboards and through our alerting through tools like Slack and PagerDuty. Um, so and most likely those are already tools that your team's using in terms of uh, development or just in-house communication. Um, so we really pride ourselves on being a force multiplier. But let me give you an example. Our um, CEO met with a, uh, an automotive manufacturer recently in the Midwest and you know the, this person told him that look, we've got 300 open information security related roles here. I can only find three qualified people to fill those roles. So talent and knowledge is at a premium. So you gotta make do with what you have and, and really um, leverage the tools that's gonna empower your team 
to monitor what's happening at the, the web application layer. And signal sciences can do that for you. And in fact, many of our customers tell us they don't dedicate a full-time employee to our solution. They basically will get it up and running, um, get the default blocking, monitoring and blocking in place that they need. And then they basically leverage our alerting uh, in, the, in the KPIs and the, da the dashboard to monitor what's happening with their applications. And then they go from there. Um, you really need that force multiplier and signal sciences can be that for you. Um, that if you don't have, you can't dedicate staff, you just don't have the knowledge in house, we can help you get that up and running and be um, you know, ready and, and ready for that, the attacks that are gonna happen. There's a, there's a saying that Zane Lackey, who's one of our co-founders has that I like to reference once in a while, and it's this, um, you know, you're getting a pen test every day. You just don't get the report given to you. Um, and we, again, know that, and what you can do is signal sciences and put it in front of your applications, get our technology up and running so that you have that first line of defense against the, the attackers at the web layer. You know, other security tooling is important. You know, obviously endpoint detection and response uh, is good to have in place. And for many companies, it's a it's the regulatory um, compliance um, requirement. But the attackers know that uh, the endpoint protection is there. So they're going starting at the network layer, layer three and four, and they're going up to layer seven at the application layer and often just bypassing you know, the endpoint. They wanna go directly to wherever the web app is uh, hosted um, and they go after the application to breach an organization. So if you get a, uh, an application security solution like Signal Sciences in place, you're, you're gonna step ahead of the game and you're, you're gonna stay ahead of the attackers. So I'll leave it at that. Um, but don't think that because you don't have security stuff that you can't leverage a tool like Signal Sciences, you definitely can. We have. We have many mid-market customers who, who do just that. Excellent. Okay, great. So um, while we're waiting to see if we get any more audience questions, and I know that I promised uh, the drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards, so I'm going to go ahead and do that, see if we get any more audience questions in, and then if we don't, we'll go ahead and close it out, give everybody a couple minutes back in their day. So without further ado, uh, the drawing for the fifty three $50 Amazon gift cards, our first winner is... Uh, Kevin Scanian, congratulations, Kevin. Second winner is Troy Elson. Troy, congratulations. And our final winner is Alan Demon. Congratulations, Alan. Um, and uh, that was a great question you asked earlier also, Alan. So thanks for that as well. Um, okay, it looks like we have not gotten any more questions in from the audience. So we'll go ahead and close out the question and answer period. I do wanna remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So if you uh, missed any or all of the uh, webinar, you will be able to uh, access it on demand. We are gonna be sending out an email uh, post event that includes a link to access the webinar on demand. Um, it's also going to be on the Security Boulevard website. So you can always go there, just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section and it should be right there waiting for you. Um, Brendan, thanks for giving such a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Okay, thanks very much. Everyone All have right. a good day. Yeah, I wanna thank the audience for joining us today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.